Welcome to the Develop Yourself podcast, where we teach you everything you need to land your first job as a software developer by learning to develop yourself, your skills, your network, and more. I'm Brian, your host. All right, today on the Develop Yourself podcast, I have a friend, Dickie Kitchen, self talk coder, who I met on Instagram. Really nice to have you on the show, Dickie. Happy to be here, Brian. I want to talk to you today about learning to code after 40 transitioning into tech without a college background, without a CS degree, and without going to a boot camp, taking the self-taught route after 40 transitioning careers, and congratulations on recently getting hired as well. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's uh, that was a, that was an interesting thing for me to finally get hired, to, to really kind of see the dream occur, <laughs> <laughs> to go from being freelance and small projects mm-hmm. here and there, to actually having that first full-time job that was that was a cool thing to have oh man i was rooting for you it was so cool watching your journey and it was interesting because like 99 percent of people i meet are on linkedin and i met you on instagram and what is your handle on instagram is it still the same yeah still the same old guy learns code that's (laughs) that's where it all started um that was awesome and and actually funny enough like I, i started that uh instagram account as a means of keeping myself accountable really um as a means yeah, my, my first goal setting up old guy learns coding was uh, to put out a weekly post showing progress, showing something I learned, um, talking about different aspects that I've come across and different thoughts that I was having so that I was holding myself accountable to everybody else that was looking at mm-hmm. me and putting comments on the pages and putting comments on the post. And it just was that one thing to kind of go, all right, if I make myself do this, I have to have something to talk about. Mm. Good so, point. you know, that, that put pressure on me to go, I have to learn something new this week because next week's right around the corner and I have to have something new to talk about. I like that. So that was one of the learning right. tools I actually used for it's that. It's really smart, actually, kind of keeping yourself motivated and accountable back. I got to make content. And how am I going to make content yeah. if I'm not learning it? And you did really good content, too. That's what drew me to you. At first, the, the handle, I'm like, old guy learns to code. I thought that was funny. And uh, we're going to talk about age and tech, too, because I think I get people that are 25 that hit me up say, am I too old to learn to code? I'm like, why? Well, I, I really hope <laughs> not. If, you, if you're too old to learn to code at 25 or 30, then, then we're all, we're all screwed. Yeah. You know? The 20 somethings are too old. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm doomed. I know. Right. I'm like, I just turned 40. You're 43. Right. And you learned to code. Yes, when did you start learning to code? Like when, did, how did that all start? What, what inspired you to code and what were you doing before learning to code? <clears throat> so in truth, like, I was interested in coding back in high school, but I always considered myself too stupid. Um, I, I didn't have a good understanding of math. Like I was a, in high school, I was like a CD student. Cool. So yeah, not real uh, strong background, <clears throat> but I realized as I got older that part of that was more attitude than anything else. Like going through high school, I was that uh rebel without a clue. Gotcha. I went to school back to college in my twenties, uh, to be a physical therapist assistant and just get my associate's degree in that. And I, I right out the gate, it was crazy because I was getting like A's and on everything. Wow. Like how did yeah, I, what was the change? There? Wait, I'm stupid. I'm not sure to do this. Uh, the change was just the willingness to do it. The, the drive, the, the, the adulthood to go, you know what, this is something I'm choosing to Nobody's pushing this on me. I'm paying. That's right. This. Didn't have grades for a scholarship, so that money was coming from me. Yeah, yeah. Why, why would you want to goof around if you're if you're footing the bill? Yeah, exactly. Um, but you know that led me to my healthcare career, and and then I always had like this interest in coding and the, this just curiosity about it. And I think in my early 30s, I had done started to do like an HTML course on uh, Code Academy, but life just didn't give me the chance to sit down and really mm-hmm. do it. So that kind of got pushed back. And then when I was trying to think if I was late 30s or if it was early 40s, I want to say I was probably like 38, 39 in healthcare, seeing that maybe this isn't the, the best for me. Maybe this isn't going to be something that lasts for me. Um, and at the time I'd already done a decade of work in healthcare. So I've been there for a while in physical therapy Mm system. But I kind of saw the writing on the wall and saw that 
things aren't going really good. This is starting to take its toll on me. I'd met a lot of healthcare workers that had burnt out and they were just nine to five in it. Um, they were no longer really serving the patients. They were just kind of trying to survive. And that's a horrible yeah. attitude to have as a healthcare oh, worker. Oh yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah, you you got to have a good heart for a healthcare worker. You got to be willing to really put yourself out there and and you know sacrifice yourself for others. And when you lose that, then you're no longer a good healthcare yeah. worker. Yeah. Um, but anyhow, I, I was you know starting to see that, and I, I sat down and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna do this. I'd heard about Code Academy mm-hmm. and I heard about Python. I was like, I'm going to do this Python. Everybody that? starts with Python. Yeah, like a yeah, big yeah, thing. yeah. Um, well, and I, I started with Python 2. And then right around that time, they had a, a Python 3 course come out. And I was like, all right, well, you know, why? I learned yeah, the old stuff. Let's yeah, learn Python sure. 3. <laughs> and that's what kind of got my hooks in and made me realize that not only was I capable of potentially doing it, but I enjoyed it. I actually liked going through and, and learning the language. Yeah, so important. To actually like it. Like that's yeah. that's the typical story. You see it, you get a, a little bite sized chunk, you say, Oh, I like this. And then that so that like yeah. kicked off your your journey. Yep, that's what kicked everything off. And then I made plenty of mistakes after that and a couple right decisions <laughs> that got me to where I'm at. I got it. man, shout out to Code Academy. I started there 11, 12 years ago. You started off there. I meet so many people that is their first introduction to coding is Code Academy. Such a wonderful yeah, site. so like Code Academy, Freed Code Camp, and the Odin Project. Those are the, oh, yeah. the top three that I normally see people start yeah. off at. All excellent resources. Um, at Parsity, the coding program that I own, we have a lot of students that did those, and then they come into Parsity for a structured learning program. And I'll, I'll be honest, I find that interesting because I'm thinking, if you did all that stuff, you know a lot about coding already. But I understand that there's more to getting a job, as you know now, than just learning to code. You went the self-taught yeah. route. Um, hey, I hope you're enjoying this episode. And if you're interested in becoming a software developer, learning how to build complex software and actually get hired, join me at Parsity.io. If you're serious about joining, just schedule a call with me by clicking the link in the show notes below. So I'll say too, like I've done um, courses. I haven't done the Odin mm-hmm. project, but I've done courses through both Code Academy and Free Code Camp. And they are excellent stepping off yeah. points. They're great places sure. to start. But I think where they lack is one, just keeping up with the, with the tech because things change so quickly. They can't always have the freshest lessons yeah. out. Um, but then the other thing is the understanding of really what you're using that tech for, where that tech benefits. Um, and that was like mistake number one for me because I, I started off learning languages, not learning coding, not learning development. Mm-hmm. Uh, like when I learned that when I did the Python three course, by the time I got done with that course, I was like, Ooh, nice. I've got the yeah, certificate. Right. And I yeah. sat down afterwards and like, now, now yeah, right. what do I write? <laughs> what am I going to build with this? Yeah. I have no idea. I started, I started writing out a, um, like a choose your own adventure type thing on, in Python, which is completely useless. Yeah. Like you're not, Python is not anything you're going to be doing front end work with. You're not going to show that to anyone. You're not like, completely useless and I, I realized at that point that you know yes i enjoy coding but what i need to learn is development mm-hmm. and those are kind of um, two different animals um and so because of that from there i ended up taking um more courses which again kind of not the brightest way to do it but i, I kind of caught on quicker that time because i started taking some html mm-hmm. css and javascript courses because outside of Python, that's what you hear all about. Exactly. You know, those three those fundamentals of everything. Um, and I was probably about halfway into some of those courses when I realized I was kind of making the same mistake. I was learning a language, not development. And I went from that to doing the um, front end engineer course on Code Academy. So that actually started teaching me more about why this stuff matters more than just creating if statements and, you know, structural stuff and styling stuff like actually what it means and what you're going to be doing with it. That is cool to hear because uh, I've did the same mistake too. You know, I'm like literally reading a book on HTML and I was, this is 12 years ago, so don't judge me too hard on this one, but I was reading this book and thinking like, well, this is how you study stuff, right? Like this is what I learned in school. You buy a book, you learn the thing and, and that, and then the, the knowledge just comes in. And uh, then I sat down at my computer. I'm like, I don't even know where to start. 
I'm like, are they going to tell me like yeah. what to what code editor to? Use? I didn't even understand that much stuff. I was like, what are the basics? Like, what code editor do I do? Like, where where do you write the code? Do you write it like in a in a document? I mean, these fundamental things were completely foreign to me, and that's when I realized, okay, I got to opt for building lots of stuff. So, how did you go from the Code Academy kind of training wheels lessons to then building something on your own? Because you built a pretty sophisticated app, uh, a book app. Yeah, Andy Bookhold. Yeah. Um, man, that started as so the the journey from like Code Academy to doing stuff like that um, started with a lot of YouTube. Okay, yeah, <laughs> like uh, because I, I started realizing the better better I got at the fundamentals on Code Academy, the more I realized what was missing, and it was like one of those things where I I couldn't find it on Code Academy, so I had to stop treating that like the source. Mm -hmm. You know, that wasn't the source of truth; it was just a starting point. And I started looking at articles online, and I started um, going through different tutorials. And um, one of them was actually I I was having trouble with one of the the lessons in Code Academy, and so I kind of ended up on a tutorial on YouTube about that lesson, which ended up catching my eye to some other stuff. It was on, it was on react. And, uh, at the time code Academy was putting a lot of focus on, uh, class components and oh. React. even though, as I started to learn functional components were the new way mm -hmm. things were being done, which, you know, kind of goes back to where I was saying they have trouble keeping up with the tech and that on those it's hard, programs. Yeah. Um, it is, it is. Things change yeah. quick. <laughs> when you're in business, it's hard to For keep sure. up. Um, but. I ended up on a uh, React Code Academy YouTube tutorial, which then ended up making me go into and find a bunch of other tutorials because I didn't feel like that one really was really teaching me that well. Um, and that kind of springboarded me into React. And then I came across this tutorial for building, it was basically like a Amazon-ish type clone thing um, where they were building out a books page for a bookstore. And I had already written a couple, uh, I'd already written a novel, a kid's book, and a novella by that time. Okay. Um, so I, I, I kind of knew a little bit about books and the sales process and uh, in particular being self-published and indie published. Like I kind of understood what was lacking from uh -huh. there. Um, and I started working in this tutorial and the way I approach tutorials is I never do the tutorial. Work Very smart. I, I look at the concepts of the tutorial and I build my own product. And that was kind of the stepping off point for what ended up becoming Indie Book Vault because I was building something to kind of showcase um, authors and, you know, bios and books written. The tutorial was just like, here's book A, here's the price, here's book B, here's yep. the price. And I kind of springboarded off of that and, and turned it into more of like a author bio type site. Yeah. And by the time I was done building that out, I had had the rough ideas for what would end up being Indie Book. Um, and that project took months to get put together and it's still a work in progress. Um, you know, we're to a point now with the indie book vault to where we've had, um, we do have some volunteers that help out nice. with it. Um, we got people who, you know, help on the social media side in particular. Um, one woman that, that I was super lucky to come in contact with, um, has actually taken over the social media for indie book vault altogether at this point, puts out way better content <laughs> than I did. My content is garbage. <laughs> But I'm not for being somebody that's really decent at front end development. I'm not an aesthetic. Oh, me stand. neither. Like, yeah, I can, I can make it, but I make it off of somebody else's design. Like oh, if totally. I'm left to my own accord making my own like designs, Craigslist. you look at it, you're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I feel you. For all the people listening, yeah, by good. the way, yeah, you don't need to know how to be a designer to be a front end developer. Like th that is totally not what you'll be doing. Somebody who knows design will no. give you the design to work with, just to get that out there. Yeah. And I will say like, it's, it's not to say if you are a designer, front end's bad for you, you know, cause if you're a designer, I have a, a buddy that I met through um, another course that I went through and she's a designer and she's really talented at, at the design she comes up with and she does front end work and it really oh, helps God. her because she yeah. understands, you know, if you understand the design, you're going to be a stronger front end developer, but you're you do not it. need to be good at design yeah. to be a, a front end developer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. A hundred percent. This is, I write about your experience a lot with the Indie Book Vault, and actually I got the chance to look at it and, and I think help with a bug on it at one point that you were, that you were yeah. working on. And I was like, I was very impressed by it. I'm like, this is really smart. But that same advice that I give to people, and I give the advice to people because I've seen it work in my own journey and in people like yours, 
but they take a problem that they actually care about and then they build a solution around that problem with code. And so you didn't build a hundred small projects. You didn't do like the to-do app, the meme generator. You built a large project that you released to the world that solved a problem for a community that you're part of and got users. And like yeah. now it seems to be like almost like a small business. Yeah, it's um, it's basically a volunteer run, I guess, not-for-profit type amazing. business at the moment. I don't know if that'll ever yeah. change. Um, you know, maybe if I'm lucky one day, it'll turn into a for- for-profit type of thing or at least make a profit to help support it. Um, but yeah, it's it's got a hundred and where am I at now? At one point we had almost 300 wow. users where we have, I had to purge some of them because we, we do have uh, certain requirements for joining. And at the time, probably about 30% fell off. And it's, it's not a necessarily a bad thing when you're, when you're dealing with self-published and any people, um, sometimes they just quit doing what they were doing. And so, you know, several of the people that I had listed, their websites went dead. Um, and you know, that's a big, not you can't, users don't want to come to your website and click on Mm -hmm. dead links. So, you know, I had to go through and get rid of all those. And then there were others that just uh, a couple of bad actors snuck in. We took care of that. Um, but now we're at 180, I think, 190, something like that. That's but, more than a lot of startups yeah. have. Did, did, that, did, yeah. that, <laughs> did that help you get hired at all in any way, do you think? Um, yeah, I don't think it hurt. And I know it got me. So, you know, kind of getting to the end of the story in the middle here. But out of 452 applications, I had three um, people interested in me. And two of them were interested in me somewhat because of that. <clears throat> the one that hired me was not, which was <laughs> hilarious <laughs> to me. I I was, <laughs> yeah, well, I went in for the interview expecting that I was going to be. That. So I, I went in for the second interview. The first interview was more of a personality check yeah. type of thing. Um <clears throat> Second interview, I was being interviewed by a lot of the developers and other people on the team. And I was expecting to be asked questions about Indie Book Vault because it's my biggest project. It's all over my resume. A um, lot of different things that I did on there went into my resume. And they didn't ask a single question about that project. They were curious about a, a math app that I had built like two weeks, maybe three weeks prior to the interview. Random. It's the interviews are so random. It really, is. Like, you don't know what's going. You just walk it in. Really I don't is. Know. <laughs> yeah, you, that's why I said you. You gotta. You really have to be comfortable being uncomfortable because I tell you, the minute they started hitting me up on an app I just built, I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I usually tell people like ask ahead of time if possible. Like, hey, what are you going to interview me on? Because otherwise, it can be a real crapshoot. You walk in, you're like, oh, let's talk about this, like. I wasn't prepared at all to talk about that. And sometimes you can't yeah. afford that. <clears throat> and I did ask, um, and I wasn't told anything. Yeah, right now. Oh, don't worry. Just come in. <laughs> they, they were a little tight lipped about it. <clears throat> Makes sense. Yeah. But that was a that was an interesting experience <laughs> on itself. You had a bunch of interesting experiences. What I'm also very curious about and impressed by is that you didn't go to school. You didn't go to a coding boot camp. How did you structure your learning and how did you stay focused and find the time as a professional physical therapist, you know, in your forties to do all this stuff, physical therapist assistant. um, (laughs) There was a lot of sacrifice to be done. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, not with my wife and son, you know, they would be going out to a friend's or going out to some event or, you know, spending time on a weekend together and I would be home behind a computer. I would be up at night behind a computer, be doing any free time I had behind a computer. Um, and I learned a lot about structuring for that way. One was just structuring my, my path, which I kind of hit on a little mm-hmm. bit earlier, which, you know, going into this, it's much better to, it's much better to have done a little research into what things are for so that you can actually know a better path to take than just going in trying to learn languages. So that was like lesson number one that I learned was that. And then <clears throat> on top of that, staying active on GitHub was another big thing that was important to me, uh, which was another late learn lesson. Uh, one of the downsides about doing Code Academy is that they have their own code editor built in and they store your projects for you. Mm-hmm. 
So all the, for a year, all the projects I had done, which were pretty significant, they were all stored on Code Academy where no one could see them. I oh, have nothing but the certificates right. to yeah. show that I ever mm-hmm. did those things. Um, and so nobody can really appreciate the work that I put in in that first year, year and three months or so, uh, because there's no way that I can show anybody that stuff. I mean, there were days where I was going for, you know, 60, 90, 100 plus days in a row of coding, and I got no way to prove it. I, I never <laughs> so, thought about that. Very yeah. good point. Yeah. I would say, you know, for anybody starting off, definitely get on GitHub early, get on LinkedIn yeah. early, um, because those are lessons I learned late. Uh, and I do think that hurt me when it came to trying to get that first position. Um, Cause how do you prove your skills? But, you know, if it's like, you're right, I didn't exactly. you're using Scrimba, you're using Codecademy, using whatever, and you do all these great projects. And then like, how do you show them to the world? You, you can't yep. uh, f- feature yep, requests exactly. for those services if they're listening. Yeah. Well, the, to Codecademy's credit, there, there are, they do mention every lesson they give you. They're like, you can do the lesson here or do it on GitHub, but they don't put emphasis on the importance of doing it on GitHub. Yeah. That's not something yeah. I learned until later. And I, I, I um, don't blame him for that exactly. You know, of course they want to keep people on their platform. Yeah. Right. It's a business decision and I get that. Um, but at least they do, you know, at least let you know it's an for option. Sure. So, but yeah, so, you know, going down that path and, and just trying to really find the structure to do that was all about failure. <laughs> really just, you know, my, my path was built on failure. Uh, I started off with learning wrong. And then by the time I started learning right, I realized that I wasn't learning in public. And then by the time I was learning in public, it was time to start applying for jobs. <laughs> and I was doing that wrong. And it was just, it was one thing after the other. But the key was at no point did I say I'm done. At no point did I give up. At no point did I have those times where I've seen people that are doing so good. Just, just stop. stop. Yeah. And I think that's the real case for success is you can't just stop. You can take breaks and I encourage sure. breaks, but you can't stop. You've hit on some great points. The consistency is by far and away the number one factor I see that will determine either somebody's success or failure when it comes to switching careers, specifically with coding, because that's the what I'm most familiar with. But in anything you do, whether it's fitness, switching careers, whatever, some life change you want to make. And honestly, it's like who 100%. can hold on longer? And, uh, and, and you also exposed a bit of the harsh reality. Like you're going to have to sacrifice something to do this. You can't just inject this new thing into your life that takes up a ton of time, mental space and be like, I'm just going to do the same things. Like you're going to have to give up something. We all unfortunately have to, for some people, it's like family time or sports or movies or whatever. Something has got to give. How long were you on this journey, by the way? How long were you learning to code before you got that first job? Uh, Three years. Okay. Yeah. Three years ish. Um, from start to finish. Yeah. It was roughly three years. Um, and that's another thing. Like there's, there's this, there's a big push. I feel like it's kind of died down a little bit, but especially when I first started, there was this big push about people starting to learn to code and getting hired within two to six months. Yeah. And I've found that to be largely a myth. It's, (laughs) it's become a thing. Even at Parsi, the program I own, I I'm, I don't want to advertise that. Honestly, it's a thing I'm like, and also I'll be honest, like if that's the kind of person you are that you want a massive life change in three months, uh, it's not likely you're going to get that. You're going to end up disappointed. I think there was a period where that was actually reality um, around the pandemic and a little before then where you, yeah. people were getting hired within three months. And I have a few students at Parsity that had that experience, but nowadays I'm like, it's going to take you longer, but I'm like, is that such a bad thing? <laughs> I just don't think it's like when you said three years, Mike, that's, that's a normal amount of time. People go to college for four years, then they get out and they have a career yeah. and they start at the beginning and then they do that career for 40 or 50 years. You. Yeah. And that's, that's exactly how I look at it too, because nowadays um, I think most people with a computer science degrees are getting masters. A lot of them are. Yeah. And three years is not masters. Yeah. You know, I did it in less time, less money, um, more sacrifice. Mm-hmm. But hmm, it's a trade-off. And, and I think that's what people need to understand coming into something like this is you have to be willing to make those trades. If you think you're going to come in and, and learn development and get a job while still having your Super Bowl Sunday parties and while still 
you know, watching football every weekend and while still taking family vacations all the time and never changing a single aspect of your life, that's what's going to make yeah. you fail. You have to, you have to be not an expert, but you have to understand time management. And for a lot of us, since yes. if you're in adulthood doing this, you've lost a lot of those skills because the last time you did that was in school. And I think that's where a lot of adults yeah. tend to fail because they think I'm going to approach this the same way that I just approach regular life or that I did school as an elementary or high school, which my, my last experience in a structured learning environment, and it just doesn't quite work. Um, before I get to uh, like the job search uh, stuff like that, I want to know, well, actually, let me just get right to that. How did you reinvent yourself from physical therapist, physical therapist assistant? Therapist okay, assistant. physical therapist yeah. assistant. How did you like transform yourself on paper to be like, now I'm a developer, you should hire me. So part of it is, is building, mm -hmm. you know, you, you have to live what you're trying to be. So things like Indie Book Vault and other projects that I worked on, some of the freelance uh, stuff that I did, um, super grateful to anybody that, that let me get a chance to build something for them. You know, working on something professionally looks a whole lot better than working on your own little to-do apps mm -hmm. or weather apps or stuff. So, you know, super grateful to all the people that let me work on projects for them. Um, but those are the kind of things like really diving into it head first, hundred percent, um, and showing that you're living that life. You know, you, that's the, the way that I had to transform myself from physical therapist assistant into a software developer. Um, and also realizing that some skills are transferred, you know, <clears throat> as a physical therapist assistant, a huge part of my job was problem solving. It was a very different type of problem solving, but at its core, it was still problem yeah. solving. And as a software developer, that's day in and day out what you're doing is problem solving. So no matter what career you're coming from, if you're a career switcher, really taking a good hard look at what the core foundation of your current career is and how that relates to what you want mm -hmm. to be, there's going to be transferable skills there. And being able to highlight those transferable skills is huge. Um, when I was in my second interview, the CIO uh, was part of that interview, and he was more interested in what I had done as a physical therapist assistant than what I was doing as a software developer. Interesting. Because he wanted to know okay. this guy had spent, you know, years. I had spent 15 mm -hmm. years. Oh, 15 years. Wow. So I had spent 15 years as a physical okay. therapist assistant. He wanted to know what about that makes you good at what you're about to do. And so really being able to go through and look at my career mm -hmm. as a physical therapist assistant and break out the parts that were applicable to software development mm -hmm. was a huge benefit for me. And that's something I would say everyone needs to be able to do. So, um, you know, you, you have to realize that you're not necessarily transitioning from this to that. You're taking part of that and bringing it with you to this. Very good point. Yeah, you're, all those skills are super important. And the longer you are in this career as a software developer, the more you find that quote unquote soft skills, which is a weird word, um, but they become as important and then more important than your coding skills. So, and also yes. being a little older, I think is a benefit. I think people look at this as if it's like some sort of detriment or it's gonna hinder you in the career search or on the job. I'm like, no, no, no. If you got out of college, and you're going into an office environment, which is where software engineers work. They work within large corporations, typically or in businesses. And if you don't understand kind of the office politics, you know, work culture in general, how to like uh, promote yourself, how to speak up, when to talk in meetings, how to write emails, all these little weird things that just come with working. And if you've worked for a while, you, you just know this stuff. Like you say, okay, I, I kind of get it. I know who's in charge. I know how to talk to my manager. I know how to promote myself. I understand like, when someone CCs or BCCs on an email and, you know, kind of with what's going on here, you understand all these little things, which can really help accelerate you in the career when you're older, which I think is actually a yeah, benefit. And understanding things like um, internal versus external customers, yeah. um, those things make a huge difference. And I think being older definitely put me in a position to, uh, to shine when it comes to those kind of things and to really be able to look back and say, okay, well, you know, as a physical therapist assistant, I did tons of customer service mm -hmm. work. I did tons of um, interacting with strangers. I did tons of having to explain high level, complicated things on to very much low level understanding of things. So that if I was talking about, you know, 
how the impacts of torn up cartilage work with some other issue. I had to be able to break that down to a way that somebody knew it. Oh, okay, if I yeah. was talking about how somebody's oh, knee oh, joint got destroyed. Yeah. They don't care how many ligaments tie their knee together. They don't care how many muscles or nerves are integrated through that. They don't care about any of that. They just want to know on a fundamental level what this impacts, how it actually goes, and what we're doing to make it better. And so being able to take a complicated subject like that and and not dumb it down, but speak to somebody at the level of their understanding they yeah. have, that's a huge soft skill to bring into a uh, software development. Oh, because for sure. I'm dealing with, my team is made up of some great people. Um, and one of the things that makes them great is they're all interested in understanding everybody else's role. But being able to talk to them about what software development is on a level that they understand. Um, I actually, yesterday, had a very long conversation with the designer I'm working with about why certain things are possible and certain things aren't. And we were able to work out her design process and approach the stories that I've got coming up, the projects mm -hmm. that I've got coming up to work on, we were able to hammer out a lot of details on that because we were both able to go back and forth and talk to each other on levels that we understood. Because as I said, I'm not a designer. So she was able to bring yeah. design elements to me and explain them in a way that I understood them. And she's not a developer. I was able to bring development uh, things to her on a way she understood. Them. And that soft skill, just being able to kind of convert information to something that somebody else understands, that's huge. Oh my God, yeah. Between that and problem solving um, and just handling pressure and time well, you know, those are things that are not coding specific uh, skills. Oh, yeah. It, but it's uh, stuff that very much can be transferred from one career to another. 100%. Yeah. And if, if getting a job as a developer was all about coding skills, then competitive programmers would have all the jobs and they don't. <laughs> There's a reason why. Yeah. And that the tale you just told about designer developer and that mismatch of expectations it's like a tale as old as time and it can lead <laughs> it can lead to kind of like combativeness when that communication breaks down because sometimes if the if designer says like i want you to build this crazy animation you're like that's just not possible and they say well i i think it is you know you can get to these these not so good communication loops but if you have a person like you that's like hey let me explain this like you've kind of said like hey let's sit down and talk about what's possible what's not how are you thinking about this at least to good conversations and, and breaks down those barriers and makes it a much more enjoyable environment for everybody. You know, we talk yeah. so much about like learning to code and, and that's the fun stuff, right? People love hearing and you got the job, but the work's not over, right? Like now the real work begins. No. What's it like being yeah. on the job now? So I, just to piggyback on what mm -hmm. you just said, though, I do think that's a really important thing for people to understand is that uh, getting the job is just step one. That's it. If you think you get the job and you win, you're done. You fail into it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I've, I've heard so many stories from people and come across people that have, they got the job and then they lost. The I've, job. I've heard that. Too, and it yeah. was because they, they thought getting the job yeah, was it. I thought that was the, the prize. That, I'm like, that's. Yeah. They thought that once they got the job, that was it. Mm -hmm. them. You get into an environment where you realize your coding skills are a joke <laughs> and you realize that. You know, you really don't know as much as you thought you knew. And a lot of people have this bad uh, way of dealing with that to where they think, keep your head down and survive when it's actually the opposite that's true. Uh, and this is a piece of advice that I, I picked up off of you from Instagram a long, long time ago, back when I first started following you, like two plus right years on. ago, uh, you, you were talking about not being the quiet developer, not being the person on a team that just sat there and kept their head down and kind of how that can be detrimental to people. Um, and I took that to heart. And so I really applied that a lot when I first got into this position. And I've only been there for, I think I just finished my 10th week. Um, Damn. But the willingness to speak up is huge, um, whether it's for good or for bad. You know, there's gonna be times where you're in meetings and you're like, oh, well, I think this could really benefit. And a lot of people are just gonna sit there on that thought and not say it out loud. Speak up, that say it. Yep. You'd be amazed at how much your team wants to hear mm -hmm. that. Um, and then on the other side, there's the the times where I've been given assignments early on where I didn't feel I was qualified. And I, I had to go to people senior to me and go, listen, I'll give this a try, but I might fail and that might hurt us as a yeah. team. And so I want to know, you know, is this a risk you want me to take or do you want to give this to somebody more appropriate? And I'll continue to build my skills and get to this. 
but I'm not there yet. Um, so yeah, that, that whole talking mm-hmm. out loud, thank you so much for that advice. Cause that has served me so well in these first that 10 really years. really belts my heart because i that was something i struggled with so much for years and to hear that you're already doing it when you wrote me and told me that i was like oh yes that's gonna like put you in that good position because if somebody did that on my team and they were more junior i'd be really impressed and i guarantee you that's how your your team feels now i'm sure they're like oh wow this guy's like transparent communicates really well is proactive i mean how has this helped you have you like noticed like your influence or cloud or respect growing within this organization um I, I, I don't. That's I don't the know. wrong I'm word. Sure. I'm not. I, but you know, but, so, but being respected at least is has it helped me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, so it's definitely helped me. I think the reason I'm still with this company ten weeks later and going in strong under my 90 day review is going to be because the willingness to speak. That's really cool to hear. Oh, uh, and I'll say this too: it's not comfortable. Oh no, no, it's it's really not. It, it doesn't really get that much easier. I mean, it gets easier, but I still don't feel that comfortable doing it. Right? I I've learned to, no. to just do it. <laughs> yeah, well, and you, it leads to things like me speaking up about um, my front end strengths and my back end mm-hmm. weaknesses led to me working on a whole lot of of really nice front end projects with a little bit of back end on them and and some stuff that I could get help with. But it also led to senior developers coming to me that were where their strengths were back in and saying, Dickie, I need your help. Oh, that's, that's always nice. And, Dude, that's terrifying. What do you mean? Nice. That was, I was so shook. The first time one of the senior devs came to me and said, I got a problem. I want your help on. I was like, you, what did you burn through every other developer on the team? Like you gotta be throwing a Hail Mary to be asking me for this. Oh, uh, seriously. I was shook. Like I, I could not believe that I had, cause that was only. Three weeks in at the time, too. I couldn't believe that I had a senior developer coming to me asking. That's kind of cool. That felt so weird. You're the expert. It's like, then it's like, whatever you say kind of goes. Like, they can't really call you out on it. They're like, okay, well, if you say that's how it works, then I'm going to have to assume that's how it works. Well, and what's funny is that, you know, I was terrified that I was going to look like an idiot trying to help him and then I wouldn't be able to help. And then I looked over the problem and I helped him. I was like, oh, wait. That that little boost. I know this. That little boost to to keep you going for a while. Yeah, well, and since then, I've had many of the other developers on the team come to me with front-end questions and go, hey, look, I'm having an issue with this. Can can you dig into this with me? And and so far, at a thousand, hey, it'll help all of them. That's so. real good. Everybody needs that little niche. You know, everybody has that one little thing. Yeah, it's yeah. like some people, could be it could be something as simple as documentation. Like, honestly, I remember oh, yeah. just doing grunt work. I was always like, uh, I can update all these SQL tables. I can just run these queries and do all these things. And, see, and people are like, like, oh, good. I don't, now I don't have to do that. I was never the strongest developer on really any team. Well, and the other thing that that it's done for me is like, um, it's led me to kind of realizing what can benefit my team Mm -hmm. uh, by having more conversations with them and working towards doing that. Like my goal, and that's the only thing I said, I I really love about the team I work on is we don't let our egos get in the way. None of us are there trying to be the best person on our team. We're all trying to make the best team. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so one of the goals that I set forward with myself was since they took a chance on me, um, because I'm definitely the most junior dude on that team. Um, since they took a chance on me, I'm trying to make it to where they're willing to take a chance on another junior level dude down the road. And one of the things I've done for that is I've started building out wikis on the, any dumb question I have to ask a senior developer. Once they give me the information, I've built out a oh, wiki. Man, so the next smart. person that comes to the door, they just go, Hey, check out this wiki. Somebody else took care of it for you. And it's just, it's just about that team environment and about trying to make the team itself better. That's really smart. And it's on it. But I think like my manager brain is going off because I'm thinking, oh, that's a good cost saving measure. Because if you could hire a junior and onboard them without having to, you know, use a bunch of senior resources, saves a ton of money. You can actually onboard juniors and then get them on the team to become mid-level developers. And you, you get a great deal. They're happy. They stay for a few years and they leave and go get the big money somewhere else. Or, or maybe they stay forever and just you've got a great deal um man this is i I enjoyed this conversation a lot and i enjoy following you on instagram and i'm really glad that you have not done what most people do which is you get the congratulations post on linkedin and they're like see ya and you never hear from ever again i get it but i i really appreciate that you haven't done that you've written articles you've still been active and and giving back and doing like a podcast like this and giving back on a saturday morning and meeting with me to chat about your life as a developer and how you've done it. At one last question, 
um, or two actually. One is any advice you'd give to people out there who are learning to code that you wish you had known earlier? So if you're learning to code, you need to realize that this isn't something you're going to pick up on a weekend. Um, the simple understanding that development is problem solving. You really want to sit down and ask yourself, do I enjoy problem solving? Because if you don't enjoy problem solving, you probably want to reconsider doing this. If you're somebody that really enjoys problem solving, then you're going to have found your home. This is going to be something that you really, truly enjoy. Um, and it's going to be something that the more you do it, the more you want to do it. But really ask yourself that question when you first get started. Ask yourself, or am I doing this because I think I'm going to make a million dollars doing it? Or am I doing it because I enjoy it? Because if you do it because you enjoy it, everything else is icing yeah. on the cake. If you're only doing this because you're trying to make money, you're going to burn out. You're going to be one of the people that doesn't make it. Yeah, man, that's advice that I sometimes get nervous to say, but I just believe that and I see it. I, I used to ask people when I worked at this other boot camp back in the days and I'd say, what, what do you, what, why are you here? Basically, you know, what did you come here for? And when people just said money and that was it, I just universally saw them fail. And I'm like, there's nothing wrong with wanting more money, right? Like we all, we, at some point you enter in this career because you want something different. You want more money, you want more free time. You want something that you're not getting from your current career. But if that is literally the only motivation, I just haven't seen anybody actually succeed where that's their only motivation and they don't find some joy in actually coding. Cause I guarantee all your coworkers probably like coding. Most developers code as a yeah. hobby as well as a profession. So you're going to meet people that just like doing this yeah, stuff. Yeah, and I would say too, like, as somebody that went from being that CD high school student to a career changer in his 40s to doing software development, I truly believe anybody can do software development. I believe anybody is capable of learning this. Anybody is capable of succeeding at this. But with the caveat that if you don't enjoy it, it's going to kill you. You, you really have to find a way to enjoy what you're doing with this, or you're just going to end up being somebody that fails you're going to end up being somebody that gets into it and has the career switch yeah, again again nobody wants to do that yeah <laughs> it's a really slow get rich quick scheme and you probably won't even get yeah. <laughs> you probably won't even get rich anyway so you should probably just pick something else i heard hot dog vendors in new york city can make 100k a year so that might be yeah oh, wow. wind turbine technician by the way also is a very hot career so <laughs> you can do it there's a lot of other stuff besides coding i don't know if people like always look at that as like the, the six-figure career i'm like there's others that you could become a carpenter electrician plumber i don't know well yeah. um anyway yeah if you want to succeed make sure you love what you're you doing should, you should ideally yeah definitely um that, that's more than just software development it's across yeah, the that, board like if you thing. really want to succeed love you, gotta, what you gotta enjoy some aspect of you if i find some in, sort of intrinsic joy um last question how has your life changed since learning to code and getting this new career Blood pressure is lower. Uh, <laughs> That's important. Ultra rate's more That's stable. really good. These are all very important Stretch things. levels are yeah. lower. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of good changes since doing that. Um, one is also just the really realizing how much I, I enjoy working on problem solving and helping people. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I've stayed active on LinkedIn um, and why I've put out posts talking about the other side of the line uh, is because I feel like it's, it can be helpful for people. I didn't, I didn't see too many people put those posts up after they made it. Yep. You know, you just like pointed out, it just disappeared. Yep. It's like, yeah, I, I succeeded. Well, okay. What, what happened? happened next? Did you get killed? Yeah. Like, where did you go? <laughs> is success yeah, just oblivion? What yeah. happens afterwards? You're fired already. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> like, and some people did, <laughs> but yeah, coming out and, and being able to be helpful to others and to encourage people, that's that's something that I've found important. And that's something that kind of carries with me from being a healthcare giver is, is really that that want to help people and that want to um, really encourage others to, to help themselves. Um, because as a physical therapist assistant, most of what I did was tell somebody to help, how to help mm -hmm. themselves. I didn't do much of the helping myself. And, uh, the way I would always put it to my patients is I'm Home Depot. I'm going to give you the supplies you build the house. <laughs> I like that analogy. You know? and, and that's kind of how I feel going into this and putting out LinkedIn posts and showing people the, the chaos in my first week and um, the benefits of being two months in, things I've learned and you know stuff along those lines. Just 
I'm hoping it helps people realize where their next step is going to be because everybody's putting out advice on how to get the job. Nobody's putting out advice on how to keep the job. Yep. Nobody's putting out advice on, on what happens after you mm -hmm. get the job, how you have to continue to work on things, how you don't stop at that point. That's like the, that's the gun going off at the start of the race. Yeah, for sure. That's all getting that yeah. job is. You're not stopping all that adrenaline you felt, all that stress you had getting the job. That's just you at the starting line. That's it. Yep. You have to really want what's next. And so that's kind of what I've hoping to do by, by staying active on LinkedIn and stuff is showing people what's next and showing people how to continue on through that. Um, um and so that's been a change for me because before I was very much the person that was looking at all these people going, all right, how did you yeah, succeed? Right. What happened? And then going, where did you go? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really glad. I love the articles you write. I love following you on Instagram. And by the way, in the show notes, we'll have links to your LinkedIn and your Instagram, if that's cool too. Yeah, Sweet. that's fine. Perfect. And yeah. uh, also, I'm less active on Instagram these days. Um, that was actually something else that I learned. I probably should throw that out there. I started doing Instagram as a means of accountability, mm -hmm. but as I got more and more into things, I realized that I was spending too much time trying to think of my next yeah. post and it was taken away from time actually doing mm -hmm. development and actually learning. So I kind of had to put that a little to the side. So my Instagram posts are far less often. I uh, might get back into it at some point. Um, right now, I'm probably going to end up doing, my goal is probably every couple months to put out a new post on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. a new article on LinkedIn, catching people up, saying what I've learned and going from there. Um, but I might jump back on Instagram some. If people are reaching out to me, I always respond on Instagram. So anybody can feel free to reach out wherever they're most comfortable, happy to answer questions. Um, but as far as truly being on it, uh, active on it, Instagram, I'm not sure when that's going to this point. I feel you, you know, gets, it's only, only so much time in a day. You can't have like, be the yeah. social media personality and learning to do all this stuff on the job. It's a, it's a tough time. Yeah. And I've still got to keep my indie book vault. Oh, yeah. And you got, so, you yeah, know, you got, got a lot of stuff personal going projects on. on the side too. And being a dad. dad. I'm Gee, busy. Yeah, busy. I'm also going to put a link to a video where Dickie does a live interview with me too, which I think a lot of people will find really helpful if they are on the interview grind and they're trying to understand what can I expect in an interview. So I'll have those links in the show notes. Thank you again, Dickie, for being on the show and sharing your story. Really appreciate you taking time to do this. Thanks for having me, man. It's been an honor being yeah, here. Yeah, for sure. All right. See you around. Have a good one. That'll do it for today's episode of the Develop Yourself podcast. If you're serious about switching careers and becoming a software developer and building complex software and want to work directly with me and my team, go to parsity.io. And if you want more information, feel free to schedule a chat by just clicking the link in the show notes. See you next week.